I would like to reflect on this university's current efforts to become more prominent on the international stage. It was not so long ago that some, of, some world traditions considered the act of crossing Conquerors and explorers, of course, didn't care about that, and pollinated cultures across real and man-made boundaries for millennia. Perhaps because I'm a physicist, I think the most significant border crossing influence in human history has been from electromagnetic waves. <laughs> Shortwave radio at first, and now telecommunication signals across a broad spectrum invade regional and national boundaries with impunity. And so do atmospheric and environmental events. We might add intercontinental ballistic missiles to that list. What started out as a single people on a contiguous landmass called Pangaea millions of years ago, then spread apart in the intercontinental drift, and now it appears inexorably headed toward becoming a single people again, held together by technology and interdependence. Against this backdrop, internationalization has become a buzzword on many college and university campuses. Some ask, aren't we already doing that? And others ask, what does that mean exactly anyway? The answer to the first question is that yes, by definition, a highly ranked research university is already international. In the 21st century, scholarly research is necessarily international, both in scope and in its networks of communication and dissemination. Indeed, we expect our senior faculty that they will demonstrate evidence of an international scholarly reputation and assume positions of leadership within their disciplines on a global rather than only a local or even national level. And in terms of the subjects of research, the term international pervades all disciplines. Every college at this university, especially the colleges of agriculture and engineering, have had a long history of international involvement. It is no surprise that the University of Kentucky faculty members are involved even in current issues of importance to India. To name only a couple of examples that I only learned recently, <laughs> Professor David Atwood of our chemistry department is developing a filter to remove arsenic from well water and also a, a sensor to tell when the filter is in fact not functioning in West Bengal. And Professor Richard Levine of the School of Architecture and the director of the Center for uh, Sustainable Cities, has been commissioned to develop the master plan for a new sustainable city near Chandigarh in India. So what is new about internationalization and how will it change the experience of our students, our faculty, and our staff? The short answer is this. At an internationalized university, the international arena is not seen as one more dimension of the courses we offer, the research we undertake or the experience we offer our students. Instead, it forms part of the fabric of our research support in infrastructure, pervades both the curriculum and the co-curriculum of our students. In other words, an internationalized university makes its students engage intensely with the world at, at large as a matter of course without special effort. As we talk about bringing international perspectives and experiences within the range of all students, we will also seek ways not only to support international research in a more intentional way, but to bring that research more visibly to bear in the classroom, not only as knowledge, but as knowledge produced internationally. In other words, we already recognize that faculty are conducting their research on a global scale, but now through a conscious project of review and enhan enhancement, we are seeking ways to ensure that the work becomes more visible and more tangible as a part and parcel of the University of Kentucky education. Internationalization needs a why before it can be a what or a how. Many of us who cross borders with regularity take the why for granted. But take these facts into account. Only about 1% of the United States undergraduate students actually study abroad. We cannot meet the demand for teachers or students of the so-called critical languages in this country. Too many Americans have no need to own a passport. And far too often, the role of the United States is seen as more central to the production of knowledge than it really is. 
Consciously or not, universities run the danger of reinforcing that perception to their students because U.S. published textbooks, bibliographies, limited to American sources, international scholars who come to the U.S. to study, the generalization of U.S.-based perspectives as universal, and the ever-present danger of attempting to speak for others. So there is clearly a need to articulate the why for ourselves as faculty and administration and for our students. I would put it this way. The reason that a university education is ethically obligated to be international in visible and pervasive ways is to teach our students to work effectively and comfortably in a world which is inexorably intertwined. Here, internationalization is closely linked to that other buzzword, engagement. We want to educate graduates who are not only globally aware, but globally engaged, who understand that they make a difference, and who set about figuring out how they can effectively have an impact on what is happening locally and globally. The Carnegie Foundation in 2005 outlined significant differences between the concepts of outreach and partnership. And our approach to internationalization is predicated on the realization that we must begin to lead our students from a 20th century vision of outreach to a 21st century vision of partnership, defined by the Carnegie Foundation as collaborative interactions with community and related scholarship for the mutually beneficial exchange, exploration, and application of knowledge, information, and resources. This model of interaction sets forth our common goal of advancing knowledge, lessening injustice in all forms, and promoting positive change in the areas of crisis commonly termed global imperatives. Too often, we have told our students that they should be aware of other nations because they will find themselves competing with those cultures in an era of globalization, a worldwide expansion of the rat race. But I think that is not the most productive image to project. Instead, we should be demonstrating that those college graduates outside of our borders are our potential partners and co-producers of knowledge and commerce. With this in mind, the experience of working in an international laboratory or school or place of business can teach our students the valuable skill of listening across cultural boundaries, as well as to speak effectively across the differences. This is what is meant by our challenge to create global citizens. Equally important is the awareness of what Robert G. Hanvey, in his book, An Attainable Global Perspective, calls perspective consciousness, or the awareness that we, have, we each have, I quote, view of the world that is not universally shared and that others have views of the world that are profoundly different from our own. In fact, we recently have had occasion to come to grips with that in the context of uh, presidential candidate Senator Barack Obama and his pastor. A recent study by NAFSA, the Association of International Educators, concludes that this consciousness, which the world now demands of all of us, is not so much a dimension of a global perspective, but its foundational prerequisite. The integration of those, this vision as a part of our central scholarly and academic mission is the goal of our current agenda of internationalization. Towards this goal, our plan at the University of Kentucky involves linking together the many arenas of global activity that have thrived in isolation, but that will bear far more fruit in synergy with each other. At the heart of this agenda lies the university's engine, the research enterprise. In addition to enhancing support for internationally focused and internationally disseminated research by our faculty and staff, we are creating a plan for bringing that work more directly into the classroom with a focus on an increasingly global curriculum as well as international research opportunities for undergraduate and graduate students. We hope that what is presented as a theory in the classroom will at the same time be made tangible through student mobility in both the recruitment of international students to our campus and educational opportunities abroad for domestic students. The idea is that study abroad can be seen as an academic experience available to all students of all majors in non-traditional situations such as internships, service projects, and geographically specific applications of coursework covered during the previous term. Increased opportunities for faculty and staff exchanges with international partner institutions as well as more active international schedule of co-curricular programming will further broaden the students' contacts with production of knowledge beyond our own borders. And finally, 
the internationalization effort involves creating networks of information to connect various international activities so that, as happened in a recent example, students in Hispanic studies can arrange service learning experiences in collaboration with the College of Medicine's Shoulder to Shoulder Ecuador project, thus connecting health sciences and humanities in a mutually productive way. Each of these pieces or internationalizing elements is already in existence at the University of Kentucky, but not in ways that reach enough of our students, faculty, and staff. In order to find ways to increase the visibility and scope of our international activity, we have, in conjunction with the deans, formed an internationalization task force whose work began last spring in conjunction with the American Council on Education's Internationalization Laboratory. This task force, representing all the colleges and professional schools, is creating a strategic plan for fostering the development of international curriculum, research, and campus climate. And both its members and I invite the contribution of your input and views throughout this process. Central to our goal is the recruitment of a greater number of international undergraduate students. Currently, currently if our undergraduates meet an international person, that person is likely to be a faculty member or a graduate student, not their own peer. We hope that by bringing more international voices into the everyday classroom discussion and team projects, students will begin to internal, internalize this vision of international collaboration, not only in spite of cultural difference, but enriched by that difference. We are pleased to note that India is currently the country from which we receive the most international students, and we hope to continue to build on those ties, while at the same time sending more of our students to work and study in India and other Asian sites. We are a land-grant university, which means that we have a particular obligation to our state. But we make a serious mistake if we allow the impression that the mission focuses on Kentucky as a cultural and economic island. Our state has experienced and been changed by the forces of migration throughout its history, but we note its impact particularly in the past decade with the incorporation of a significant and growing Hispanic population. Our state mandate includes leading students to better understand the historical and cultural backdrop for this phenomenon, its economic impacts now and in the future, and the ways in which this contact enriches as well as it challenges the state. This is really the essence of our internationalization effort, and I invite all of you to participate in it in the years to come. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Provost Subhaswamy, and I cannot tell you how pleased I am that you are leading our globalization and internationalization effort. And there are many faculty here today who have expressed strong interest and in given leadership to that effort. I would like to ask our Board of Trustees members, I see many of them on the front row, Mrs. Ball, who is the chairman of our board, is on stage and will be participating in the ceremony today. But would you all stand and let us give you a round of recognition? I might add it's probably in your program, but Dr. Kabi Tagavi is going to participate today as the president of the University Senate, and Janine Blackwell, the dean of our graduate school, is also uh, on stage with us. The greatest honor that a university can bestow is to award its honorary degree. In presenting an honorary degree, the institution is honoring itself. Those who are to receive this honor are persons who are carefully chosen and whose contribution to the social, educational, humanitarian, and cultural heritage of state, nation, and the world, especially in this case, are of the highest order. Today, the University of Kentucky is honoring a person of extraordinary distinction. Provost Subhaswamy will now introduce the recipient. X is an international sign. <laughs> 
Mr. President, I have the honor to present to you His Excellency Dr. Abul Pakir Jainaluddin Abdul Kalam. By the authority vested in me by the Board of Trustees, the University Senate recommending, I am pleased to confer upon you the degree of Doctor of Science with all of the rights and privileges pertaining hereto. Go Big Blue. <laughs> Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam became the 11th President of India on July the 25th, 2002, and held that office until 2000, July 24th, 2007. During his term as President, Dr. Kalam focused on the visionary task of transforming India into a developed nation by 2020. Uh, a year we're all looking forward to as well. The government of India has honored him with the nation's highest civilian honors, the Padma Bhushan in 1981, Padma Vihushan in 1990, and the Bharat Ratna in 1997. Dr. Kalam has also achieved international recognition for his professional work in the fields of science and engineering. He made some significant contributions as project director to the development of India's first indigenous satellite launch vehicle, the SLV-3, which successfully launched the Rohini satellite into near-Earth orbit in July 1980. He was responsible for the evolution of ISRO's launch vehicle program particularly the PSLV configuration. Dr. Kalam also served as the scientific advisor to the Defense Minister and Secretary, Department of Defense Research and Development from July 1992 until December 1999, and from November 1999 to November 2001 as the principal scientific advisor to the government of India. For these reasons, Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam is recommended as recipient of the 2008 Honorary Degree of Science. Thank you. I would like to add my personal congratulations to Dr. Kalam and invite him to honor us with some of his remarks. Uh, Professor, Professor Lee Todd and Professor Subhaswami and Mr. Paul and uh, Dr. Takabi and all the, all the members of uh, uh, Board of trust, uh, Trustees, faculty members, students, distinguished guests. Yeah. Dear friends, today I am delighted to be in the midst of the members of the University of Kentucky, recognized for its world-class arts, science, and technology programs. And my greetings to the student, faculty members, alumni staff, and distinguished guests and assembled here. I consider it as a great honor to me for being awarded the Doctorate of Science by prestigious university whose core values are innovation, creativity, 
problem solving and collaborative teamwork which is essential for a sustainable societal growth. My greeting to the university authorities and the board of trustees. Dear friends, today morning I had an interaction with uh, with Gatton College of Business and Economic students and faculty, where I have already elaborated on the possible collaborative research mission between University of Kentucky and Indian universities through the establishment of World Knowledge Platform. Now I would like to talk on the topic, uh, Dynamics of the Peace. During the year 2003, I visited one of the Indian states, Arunachal Pradesh. I visited a Buddhist monastery at Tawang, 3,500 meter altitude. I stayed and spent some time, nearly for a day. I observed a unique situation in all the villages nearby, where young and experienced were all radiating happiness in spite of severe winter environment. Then I visited the 400 years old Tawang Monastery itself, and there also I saw monks of all age groups in the state of, in the, in the state of serenity. I was asking myself, what is the unique feature of Tawang and the surrounding villages which makes people and monks to be at peace with themselves? When the time came, I asked the chief monk how Tawang villages and monastery I am experiencing a peace and happiness being radiated by everyone. There was a pause, the chief monk smiled. He said, you are the president of India, you will, know, you will be knowing all about us and the whole nation. Again I said, it is very important for me, you please give me your thoughtful analysis, I asked the monk. There was a beautiful golden image of Lord Buddha, radiating smile and peace. The chief monk assembled, assembled nearby all his nearly 100 young and experienced monks. The chief monk and myself were sitting amidst them. The chief monk gave a short discourse, which I would like to share with you. Chief monk said, quote, in the present world, we have a problem of distrust, unhappiness transforming into violence. This monastery spreads, this monastery spreads when you remove I and me, when you remove I and me from your mind, you will eliminate ego. You will eliminate ego. If you get rid of ego, hatred towards fellow human beings will vanish. If the hatred goes out of our mind, the violence in thinking and the action will disappear. If violence in our mind is taken away, peace springs in human minds. Then peace and peace and peace alone will blossom in the society." Unquote. I realized the meaning of the beautiful equation for peaceful life but difficult mission for the individual is how to remove the ethos of I and me. For this we need the education inculcated in the young age in all our educational institutions. Recently, I met His Holiness Dalai Lama during the launching of Global Foundation for Civilization Harmony at New Delhi. Dalai Lama said, His Holiness said, that as per the one of the medical research study, it has been found that the people who utter the word I several times have greater tendency to have health problem both physically and mentally. <laughs> In my search for evolving a peaceful and prosperous society, I got part of answer, part of the answer. My search for real truth continues. I saw an incident, I saw an ancient Christian monastery in Bulgaria where I had a discussion with highly experienced monks on the message of Tawang. The monk added that the forgiveness is also the foundation of the good life. Similarly, in the birthplace of Swami Vivekananda, 
I explained the Tawang experience to the disciples and they too felt the Tawang experience indeed is beautiful. They added, trait of giving will add to peace and happiness. Then I visited Ajmer Sharif where I participated in the Friday Namaz. Here the Sufi expert told me that Almighty's creation, the man has been challenged with another powerful creation of Shaitan. Only good deeds lead to good thinking. Good thinking results into a actions radiating love as commanded by the Almighty. While talking about good deeds, I am reminded of the advice given to Gandhiji by his mother when Gandhiji was a nine-year-old boy. She says, mother said to son, son, in your entire lifetime, if you can save or better someone's life, you are birthed as a human being and your life is a success. You have the blessing of the Almighty God. This is the advice Madhra Mahatma Gandhi gave to her son. This advice has made a deep impact in the mind of Gandhiji, which made him to work for the humanity throughout his life. During his 100th birthday of His Holiness, Sri Sri Shivakumar Swamiji of Sri Sittaganga Math Tankur, a southern state of India, a message of giving came to my mind celebrating his contribution which I would like to share with you. It says that, uh, oh, oh, oh my fellow citizen, in giving you receive happiness in body and soul. You have everything to give. If you have knowledge, share it. If you have resource, share it with the needy. Use your mind and heart to remove the pain of the suffering and cheer the sad, sad hearts. And giving, you receive the happiness. Almighty will bless all your actions. What a message. What message do we get from all this experience? All this experience gave, give an insight that human being can attain lasting peace and happiness only when they rise above themselves and work towards serving others without external temptation. Is it utopian goal or is it practicable in their day-to-day -day life? I have come across many incidents where people have, irrespective of their normal professional affiliation, have come forward for great societal mission by giving. While I'm with you, I would like to recall one event that has resulted in the evolution of peace doctrine by five great souls. I remember at that time, I was the principal scientific advisor. On 30th September 2001, I was on my way to Pokhara, a steel town from Ranji in Jharkhand, when the helicopter carrying me crashed moments before landing. The helicopter hit the earth with a terrible impact after its engine failed and I saw all around the broken pieces of rotors and many parts of the helicopter. All of us on the board had a miraculous escape. Grateful to God, but unfazed by the incident, I went ahead with my scheduled program of addressing the students of Pokhara and the members of management of Pokhara Steel Plant. At night, however, a panel of doctors checked me and persuaded me to take a tranquilizer to alleviate my perceived shock. The truck made me sleep. The truck made me sleep hours ahead of my usual time, 1 a.m. Also, I failed to rise at my usual 6 a.m. and woke up only after 8 o'clock. It was, however, a disturbed sleep and sometime in the middle of it turned into a dream. In the dream, I fell to thinking, why the human race, the best of all God's creation, has been so deeply divided by violence? I imagined a conversation between five people who together symbolize the first attributes of the human mind, whom I admire deeply. Through their conversation, I sought an answer. In this experience, much more intense and vivid than a dream, though for want of better word, I shall term it that I saw myself in a desert with miles of sandy hills in all around. There was a full moon and desert was bathed in the, its light. Five great men, Mahatma Gandhi, Albert Einstein, Emperor Asoka, Khalifa Umar, and Abraham Lincoln stood in a circle 
their clothes ruffled by the wind, sandy wind. I felt myself dwarf standing next to the majestic Emperor Ashoka. Ashoka led two lives, one as a ruthless conqueror, conqueror and the other as a compassionate ruler. The man I stood beside was the one who had just returned from conquest, but victory had been obtained at a heavy cost. The Battle of Kalinga claimed the lives of at least 100,000 people and an equal number were wounded. I saw everyone looking at Asoga, who fell on his knees and removed his armor and crown. His face was pale, reflecting the death surrounding him. He looked at the sky. He saw the bright, cool moon shining and God's grace pouring down on the Mother Earth. And he looked down at the horror he has created, making blood flow everywhere. In that moment of beauty and horror, the silver moonlight moonlit night and the suffering and pain on the ground when nature itself seemed to speak out against what he has, do what he has done. Then the Ahimsa Dharma was born. Emperor Ashoka embraced God's command to propagate the love for the human being through, the, through this Ahimsa Dharma doctrine. As I stood by, I wondered why the Kalinga war why the assassination of Mahatma Gandhi? Why the assassination of Abraham Lincoln? Or many other like them? Has God Almighty faltered in his creation? Is the destruction of the mankind essential for a second creation? In that blissful silence, the Mahatma Gandhi spoke. He said, friends, the divine message we are hearing is the message of creation. Since we all belong to planet Earth, we may give a message to mankind how people of different races, religion, and languages can live peacefully and prosperously together. God Almighty, Mahatma Gandhi said, God Almighty has blessed us all with something unique that we pass on to mankind through our deeds and efforts. Is that working? Is there any divine message or doctrine? Divine beauty should enter into the human soul and the happiness blossom in the body mind. Is it possible? Also, Lord, the Emperor Asoka said, Friends, there is one thing I have realized. There is no victory in causing suffering. Triumph is a peaceful kingdom. Khalifa Umar said, Khalifa Umar said, I learned after I entered Jerusalem that all men are equal. There is no point in forcing others to follow your path. You will get only that which is ordained for you. God alone is the sovereign. Khalifa Umar never saw his position in terms of his special privileges that is carried. To him, government was a sacred trust and he, he did his best not to betray, betray the trust in any way. It was Einstein's turn. Einstein said, I would like to recall my friend Werner Heisenberg view, quote, you know, in the West, we have built a large, beautiful sh ship. It has all the comforts in it, but one thing is missing. It has no campus and does not know where to go. Men like Tagore and Gandhiji and their spiritual forebearers found the campus. Why can't this campus not be put in the human ship so that both can realize their purpose? Abraham Lincoln, the great American leader who fought against the slavery, whose life paralleled that of Mahatma Gandhi in many respects, said at this point, quote, there is one thing that I would like to say. Happiness comes from the family's prosperity and happiness at various levels. God's grace gives bliss to human lives. Happiness and bliss are two important components of a godly life on earth. Perhaps there is so much conflict between people and nation because in our pursuit of prosperity and power, we have lost sight of ethical values. We must ask ourselves, what is the role of human consciousness? Does it have a part in political thinking, scientific thinking, and theological thinking? Is spirituality acceptable in the business of life? Mahatma Gandhi recalled sage Astavakra, who propounded to the people, Oh, my son, you are, the very con you, are, you are the very consciousness within which arises this phenomenal universe that is not separate from what you, what you are. How can there be a question of anything being acceptable or unacceptable? Does it mean conscience is the light of the soul that burns within the chambers of our psychological heart? 
the five great souls concluded, let the business of life be peace and prosperity, and not exploitation and conflict. Giving always gives highest order of happiness. This is our message to the planet. Everything, everything that we do, any doctrine that we expose should be for the good of man, humankind. Recently, friends, in conclusion, recently I came across a book, Five Minds for the Future, written by the, the Howard Gardner. My curiosity and desire increased to go into the details of this book, particularly in the today's world, the environment of the social conflict, political, political violence, impact of global attrition. I studied the five minds of the future. The, let me describe based on my understanding. Do, number one, the disciplinary mind. Number two, number two, synthetic mind. And number three, the creative mind. Number four, respectful mind. And number five, the ethical mind. In the, in the present scenario, the need for respecting minds and ethical minds is very important because many of the societal problems today are arising out of the lack of consideration for others and the overwhelming selfishness of the individual. The education system has to cultivate these minds among the youth so that they learn to respect others, are tolerant and preservant for realizing their goals in life. Once again, let me thank the members of the University of Kentucky for this unique honor of my being awarded with a degree of doctorate. My best wishes to all the members of the University of Kentucky for success in their mission of providing a distinctive education to the youth from many parts of the world, which will enable them to solve many societal issues. And my best wishes, may God bless you all, friends. My script asked for me to ask the audience to stand and give you a standing ovation, but they are well behaved, so they, uh, <laughs> your greatness preceded that comment. Uh, I just want to say in conclusion, um, I have now heard the President speak three times, and I can attest to the fact that we knew in reading his background that he was an intellectual technologist, a fellow engineer. Uh, I've learned since he's been here that he is a compassionate humanitarian. He is a man that has a strong belief in a higher purpose, and that is to take his home country of India from being a developing country to being a developed country. And as you can also see, he is a strong man of spirituality. And so it indeed is an honor for this institution to honor you with our highest degree. We thank you so much for being here. At this time, this concludes our academic celebration in honor of His Excellency, Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam. I want to thank all of you participating today and wish you well. Thank you. Thank you.